Yeah, get it on. Got to get on a chosen gun on Monday. Get it on. Thanks for tuning in. We love that about you. Johnny Ferraro is here. You've seen him in the 30 for 30 doc, uh, American Gladiators, the uh, documentary, which I watched. I, I watched both versions. I watched yeah. the Netflix version and uh, the 30 for 30 version as well. Uh, good to see you. Thank you. Um, so was it pure coincidence that they both sort of came out around the same time uh, this this american gladiator resurgence i i think they uh the gladiators when we were first started talking to them we we're going to try to make them part of the 30 for 30 but they went off and did their own and i think they had it right plan right along that they were going to come out pretty well, close to what we're doing so it's like they'd already <clears throat> committed to the netflix version of it well not in the beginning not in the beginning. Um, we were trying to get them on the ESPN, and uh, but somehow they were talking with you know Dan Clark, who plays Nitro. He mm-hmm. was start talking to uh, to Netflix because he thought he'd get a better deal or some more money or something, and and uh, he ended up taking some of them along with him. And you know, do you think that's why a lot of them said no to coming on the Thirty for Thirty? Why they said no? Yeah, because they already had a deal working. On no, you know the the thing is, is that um, when I initially talked to them, you know, uh, Vice come to me and they says, "Listen, we would like to get some, all the gladiators." So I called them. I said, "Listen, you guys want to be part of this documentary we're doing?" And you know, a lot of them said, "Yeah, we tower," and a lot of those says, "Yeah, we want to be part of this." and and then as time went on, you know, they start wanting money, and, and Vice says, well, we don't pay anybody. And I told them that, and then they went out, and they start talking to Netflix. And then the director, Ben Berman, calls him up and says, hey, we, got, we have uh, ESPN. And he said, too late. We already signed with Netflix. You know, I know that Lori Fetrick, who said, I says, well, Johnny Ferraro is the reason that they didn't do it, which that's not true. You right. know, it's just... Uh, but they said that in the thirty for thirty as well. Yeah, yeah. but that's that's not true. They, that 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 thirty for thirty is so wrong. Are you, well, I was going to ask, are you happy with how it turned out? Because it it kind of pained you in various. You want to know what? If I was happy, I wouldn't be here. Mm. <laughs> no. yeah. Same uh, here. Yeah. Did uh, so? What did so thirty for <clears throat> thirty got it wrong, but Netflix didn't, or who got they, it more they, wrong? Well. The Netflix really isn't a documentary on American gladiators. It's it's more like you have these gladiators from 30 years ago that still feel they're gladiators, and they mm-hmm. wanted to go off and do their own thing, and then they end up calling it American gladiators or Ma- Muscles and Mayhem, and uh, because if it would have just been Dan Clark or whoever, no one I think would have tuned in. But as soon as you had that name, American Gladiator documentary, they got the audience. Well, I, you know, so there's a couple of things about American Gladiators. I'm, I'm the right age because I remember watching it in real time. I remember a few, there's a few connections I have to American Gladiators. Uh, one is, is uh, at least on the Netflix version, uh, the guy was honchoing the thing, trying to sell it into syndication was Mark Itkin. Mark Itkin was my agent at William Morris for oh, a yeah. million years. Yeah, I know Mark, yeah. Because, and Mark was a big buff dude yeah. too. Um, they, he was in charge of like reality TV over, over at William Morris. He handled a burgeoning reality TV segment, which didn't really exist in the mid nineties, you know. Um, I have some of the shows or, he's worked on, or, Real or, World, yeah, Project Runway, Hell's Kitchen, Deal or No Deal. Yeah, and he did Loveline, too, because Loveline was a sort of fell under the heading of reality, mm-hmm. and we took it to the NAPTI convention that I guess they used to have. I don't know yeah, if they have I anymore. And we those, did the yeah. same thing. We had to me and Doctor Drew went to oh. Vegas, sat in a booth for like New World before it was going to be on MTV, and sold Loveline at the convention the same way you saw it with the American Gladiators chronicled. Yeah. at least in the Netflix version. Um, so not only do I know Itkin, but Jim O'Doherty. Yeah, Jimmy, yeah. Jim O'Doherty's the guy who warmed up. He was the audience right. warm-up for American Gladiators. And I was with that guy at the Acme Comedy. And the one time I did audience warm-up is when he had to leave 
America's Funniest Videos or whatever to get to the American Gladiator set to warm up the audience, and he needed someone to fill in for him, and I filled yeah. in. He just goes yeah, in now. He's great. Yeah, Jim Doherty's fantastic. I he, talked to him, my geez, right after the show. Uh, ESPN already called me up. Oh, really? Yeah, he always comes up with ideas. He says, I want to run something by you. Jim? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Jim's a good guy. Yeah. You know, do you remember what his big move was, his big comedy <laughs> move was? No. His big comedy move is he could do the sound of someone being electrocuted or short, like an electrical <laughs> short, whatever that sound is, you know, that buzzer or whatever. And his big move would always be like, he'd be on stage and he'd go, uh, oh, uh, I got to adjust this light or something. And he'd put his hand up or something and he'd make the, like the, the electrocuted sound. Yeah, yeah. Does that it, sound familiar now? No, you know, I know he warmed up the show. He did a great job. And then I, he went off to do Third Rock in the Sun, I think it was. He did Married with Children back in the day. Oh, he did them all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I remember. He was a writer, though. He was, a, I think, a writer on, on Third Rock. I, he, my mind was blown because I was working as a carpenter and I was making about 12 bucks an hour and I was making about 100 bucks a day. And he'd tell me, yeah, I go do American Children. Uh, sorry, uh, Married with Children. I get like 1,300 bucks for a night. And I was like, fuck. What time, <laughs> do, you, what time do you have to be there? And it's like, six o'clock. And I'm like, what time are you out of there? Nine o'clock. I'm like, oh, you get 1,300 bucks. Mine just <laughs> melted. My, I was like, I got to get into that. Yeah, he was great. I liked him. So you start off in Erie, Pennsylvania, right? So the story is, and, and here's where it went south. You know, mm -hmm. when I was approached by the vice president uh, of Vice Studios, you know, he gets a hold of me. And during this time, I'm, I'm approached like five times a month. Hey, we want to do a documentary. And I'm really protective of stuff, you know, because I know how they go. And, and he says, you're the American success story. The story has to be told. I says, well, you know, I said, I'd like to do it about my journey on the creation of the show. You know, and I says, I'm the only one that started it from the very beginning for 41 years. There was nobody with me. It was, I was pretty much alone. And uh, so we end up doing this, this agreement on it. And uh, so a friend of mine, Dan, Dan Carr, and we were, you know, close. I mean, we were good friends, you know, and uh, back in Erie. And, and uh, he comes to my house and, uh, and he says, you know, I, would you sponsor me for, for um, doing, uh, you know, being a wrestler? I says, uh, no, that's not my thing. I don't want to do that. This is back in the day. 1982. And Dan Carr's big sort of tough man, bouncer. Steel worker guy. He was an iron worker. Danny was an iron worker. Fell like uh, seven stories. Broke like every, his lung, his kidney. Lost a lung, a kidney, and worked himself up to be this, you know, really tough guy, you know. And you know, I always had a lot of respect for Dan because when I was entertaining, he'd come into the club and all these guys. Because I was like maybe 150 pounds, 160. You were pounds. the Elvis impersonator. Well, I did, I stopped doing that when I was 26. Mm -hmm. You know, I I said I you know I was an entertainer. I was a singer. You know and and by the time Dan come to me, you know, I was I already I was building the biggest goals in the world. I had a record on the charts. I had a, a you know, pretty big estate, you know, and I had a jet helicopter on the pad. I wasn't this guy struggling out there trying to be an Elvis guy. You're being the biggest golds gym in the I, world. I be yeah. I started the big box gyms for golds. Mm -hmm. uh, I met Pete Grimkowski uh, and those guys who, you know, had golds. And I said, you know, Pete, I'm going to build you the biggest golds in the world. And I built a 30,000 square foot, three, $4 million gym. And I had the state-of-the-art physical therapy. I had, uh, we had uh, lounges in it. It was just incredible. It was way ahead of its time. And, and when I did that, they start going into the franchising. And that's when they start going into the big box gyms. So uh, Dan comes to you. So Dan comes to me and he says, well, I got this other thing. He said, we do this thing called King of the County. I said, what's that? He said, well, we have these iron worker picnics. I said, Danny, it's just a concept. I said, we, if you know, we do it, I, we're going to have to get it on film. So I, says, uh, so I said, let me think about it. So I called him. I said, no, this is a pretty good idea. I said, let's, let's have an event. So he goes back, and, and he's work, trying to <clears throat> excuse me, talk about doing different cities and things like that. And I just wanted the film. That's all I wanted. So 
we have an event at a local high school gym, the Tech Memorial in Erie. Well, you know, I brought in all the cameras. I, br- I made it the production. It wasn't on, no longer an Iowa worker picnic. And, and it's not exactly a tough man competition, but it's like arm wrestling and tug of war yeah, and that yeah. kind of stuff. It, the concept was different, different uh, events and to see who the, the toughest guy was out of all those events. The guy you don't want to get in a phone booth with. That, right. that, that was the idea. <laughs> and, and so, you know, I brought in all, the, all the, the lights and the cameras and had seven cameras, had it filmed. I scored the whole show. And the way they explained it on ESPN, like I was there spying on it and I stole the idea. And that's not what happened. I paid for all of it. You know, and you promoted and, it too, right? Well, Dan, you know, don't forget Danny Samiri. That Danny is great at that stuff, and and he was the MC, and he's on. You know, he added so much excitement, but it was the music. It was like battle to rock and roll. We had like four thousand people there, and I I felt like Ed Sullivan. I went, hmm. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I, I think we got something here. So from that I, night on, Dan was gone. You know, I, I, that's what I didn't understand because I spent forty one years. You spent like three hours. Dan Carr. Yeah. Right. And, and that's kind of what happened on that. And so I, I start going out and knocking on doors trying to sell this, this idea. So 1984 comes by, you know, and I've already invested probably like $300,000. And, and, you know, Dan says, John, why don't you buy me out? I says, uh, well, you know, he said, give me 25000 You know, I says, Danny, I think you could do much better. I said, let me pay you on a percentage because I think this can be really big. And so I worked out a deal, and in 1984, and I brought the contract with me. Wow. You know, yeah. 1984, he signs over his percentage of, uh, of the concept, and, and uh, he had no more involvement with American Gladiators. He was gone. But unfortunately, it's like when you buy a house, the guy won't move out. And that's kind of what happened here. So Dan felt like I owed to tell him everything. And, you know, I need, you know, I have to report. I said, no, I own everything. It's mine. He gets a percentage, though. Yeah. So, so, but, you know, and to date, he's made over $100,000. You know, because don't forget, if you take the, I spent $500,000. And I, I left my home. I left my family, my son, knocking on doors, living in a hotel room. I did that for like eight years, seven, eight years. Trying to sell this. Trying to sell this, trying to pitch everybody. And I, you know, I I mean, and the whole idea with this whole thing with Vice was I had such great stories. There was like, you know, Frank Sinatra's, you know, friend for Frank Sinatra, and I was at Roy Orbison's, and Johnny Cash's, and this whole journey over 40 years, and they concentrated, somehow they got it in their mind that I took this from Dan, and it was so far from the truth because at the end of the program dan says i have no regrets you know i have no regrets well but if he made a hundred grand and the franchise or you have made x amount and i'm guessing that's millions no of dollars. No, no no because no because you have to understand back then and and uh i was on, i was only making two thousand dollars an episode which is nothing Oh, when it was sold, when it was yeah, that's all I was making back wow. then. Wow, yeah, it was nothing, and and um, right now my I, my agreement with Dan, I, I'm giving him more than that. What is uh, who came up with the title? You know, that's another thing. <laughs> Going back to the <laughs> folder, some receipts in there. Yeah, Danny says King of the County. You know, and I said, Danny, I really don't like that name, but even though he swears by it, I thought of the name. I thought of the name. The name come from this. We're looking we at that. Elvis Presley did a documentary called Gladiators uh, in 1974. Uh-huh. And I said, listen, how about the name Gladiators? And somehow the name American Gladiators. But you want to know it, and I'm, I'm glad we're talking about this. To me, Dan and me were like, we were like the Wright brothers. I don't care who thought of the name. I really don't. You know, one didn't say I thought of the wing. Well, I thought of the tail. You know, they uh-huh. did it together. And we started this thing together. There was no I did this and I did that. But Dan just never told people that he sold it to me. He right. let people believe that he was still there, was still his, and it wasn't. Yeah, and what people don't really realize is well, a couple things. It was a phenomenon. And not only was it a phenomenon, but it if you want to know if somebody said, like, what – 
was this period of time in America like from like 1989 to 1995? So like, what did it look like? What did it sound like? What was the color palette? What were the hairstyles? What did we what did we enjoy? What were people into? You could just watch yeah. an episode of American Gladiators and go, that's a time stamp on exactly where we were. And you get a little nostalgic when you watch it because you go, oh, yeah, we weren't just arguing about race constantly. We weren't talking about uh, the environment. We weren't having all these insane. It was fun. It we, was fun. we knew what a man was and a woman was. Like It was, it was just good-looking people dressed in shiny shit, beating the shit out of yeah. out of uh, everyone around them. <laughs> and and it was good, but you really, f- you kind of forgot that the gladiators were people, there was injuries, like oh, yeah. they were taking a pounding on that show. Yeah, but you know, a lot of these guys were, were sports athletes. And on their agreements, it says, listen, there might be injuries on the show. And this was American gladiators, it wasn't American tennis. You know, and... and yeah, they got no more injuries than if they played soccer or if they played football or MMA is 10 times worse. You yeah. Know? And don't forget, each event lasted like 30 seconds. You each know? their career was. No, the, the the, event. each event. Oh, the event. Yeah. Each Sorry. event was, you know, joust lasted maybe five seconds, 10 seconds. I mean, Powerball was like maybe a, a minute, you know. It wasn't right. like it went on forever and ever. It, and it, they had pads and stuff. But the problem is, is that you know, I remember my Gemini, Michael Horton, you know, he actually lost. And and he come to me, he says, man, I was at McDonald's or somewhere. And he says, these kids come up and said, you lost. He said, from that day on, I'm never going to lose again because he was so embarrassed, you know. And and uh, so when these gladiators would team up on, on a contestant, I mean, they'd really, it was real stuff. I mean, it was. Yeah, it was, it was real. And it was great. Appointment viewing, and I, I just, and you would always sit around. Anyone who played football in high school would sit around and go, I "Wonder how I would do." Yeah. Oh yeah, and it that, looked fun. It was the thing was, I can do that. I would say, you know, you can get on Gladiators. You know, you're not going to throw a football for the 49ers, but you can get on American Gladiators, and that was kind of the whole idea of this thing, you know. And it just, it just really, it just took off. It was like a rocket. So, know? did you? Who pitched it? Did you come to Hollywood? Yeah, I, I. I left, like I said, I left my home, and I was staying at the Sheridan Universal for like seven years, right. and and I'd pitch. I mean, I drove Telly Savalas crazy, <laughs> you know. I, Telly I mean, Savalas uh, owned that hotel. Yeah, I was. And, with, he, and the sports bar in the basement was called Telly's. So Kojak yeah. owned. I get. I don't know if he owned the hotel. He no, lived no, there. No, he lived there. He had to deal with uh, Universal, where they gave him a, a suite there. Telly Savalas lived at that hotel, and the sports bar was named after him. And I got to tell basement. you, he was the nicest guy. He could be, he'd have dinner, and no matter whoever went up or breakfast, no matter what he was doing, he'd give an autograph, you know, or hug or whatever. He never, ever turned anybody away. And I, his mother, Mama, um, she somehow broke, she fell and she broke her back. And she would sit in her chair and she'd draw, and she painted me two pictures that I have on my wall. And she had that Greek accent. She'd go, Johnny, no guns, Johnny, no guns. You know? Yeah, well, so yeah. you were originally trying to sell the show as a, a scripted feature? I was, yeah. I, I went around because, you know, I had, we had, actually me and Dan, we worked on, he, <clears throat> when I was doing Gold's Jam, I, I'm wor- hanging with like Lyle Alzado, Louis Ferrigno, um, the Barbarian Brothers end up being my roommates, Dave and Peter Paul. They made a movie about the, with those guys. I, I know. They, I, I was with them when they were filming uh, D, DC Cab. Oh, they were in DC Cab. A, yeah. a long... Yeah, and they were something else. Those along two guys with were, Mr. But T. they were great. They were yeah. your roommates? Yeah, oh. yeah. I, moved, I went to Marina Del Rey because I was spending such a fortune on, on hotel rooms. I met this friend of mine, and he says, listen, why don't you just stay with me in Marina Del Rey? And then I get a call like at two in the morning. It's, I think it's David. Johnny, 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 someone's trying to kill us. I said, what do you mean? He's someone's trying to kill us. You know? So I said, all right, you guys can stay here. So they end up staying there. And you walk in, they have these, I don't know, what, what the, the machines that, uh, what do they call it, the TENS units? They pump up your muscles and stuff. They, they, you know. Oh, they're hooked up to them. Yeah, and they, and they lay there like this and just, you know. <laughs> they had a, Impulsing. they had, the, we had the Barbarian Brothers and the Barbie Twins at the same time. <laughs> the Barbie Twins were two sort of, they were sort of the female version of the Barbarian Brothers. These two skinny chicks with huge tits 
and big blonde hair that were overly tanned. It was it was a we- name then, yeah. It was a weird era, but I yeah. think they were around they're around in the same time. So anyway, um, you get it sold to be a TV show, how? No, so <laughs> God, you make me go back all these years. So um I'm pounding the pavement. I'm pitching anybody, anybody that would listen. I had, if I had to dress up like a waiter to pitch somebody, I was going to do it. <laughs> and I did it to this young lady named Gail Dickey. And I, you know, and I taught to Gail this morning, you know, and we still laugh about that. And, uh, you know, I just, anybody that was anybody, uh, who do you, who are you? What do you do? And I want to show you something. And so I end up going into this, I think it was Orion, and I go into this room and, and the guy says, listen, I have to read all these scripts, and they were like four deep all the way to the ceiling before I get to yours. And I says, do you have a cassette deck? He says, yeah. I said, I'll be back. So I went back to Youngstown, Ohio, and I went into a studio, and I had like eight or nine minutes of it narrated, and I added the music to it, and it kind of told the story. And I had a folder done of the gladiators, and this way, when the guy would get in his car, he could just play it. And it was there. Or if I try to pitch it, all you had to do was pull out that folder and you felt like you knew these gladiators. And I will go around with my little radio, you know, and and my little pitch deck. Was the pilot that big a nightmare? Yeah, it, it was. Uh, I think we shot like four or five o'clock in the morning at the equestrian center in Toluca Lake. And I remember, who was that guy, Bramscombe? Yes, yeah, I'm and glad you brought him up. Because he, he comes up to me, he says, Johnny, I'm going to make all your dreams come true. I'll never forget that. And I thought if there's anything I could ever do for this guy, I, I, I could do it. Because I'll never, ever forget that, that he did that. Bramscombe was the coordinator, like the stunt coordinator yeah, on yeah. that. I'm trying to think of his Third last thing. name. Oh, it was down. Yeah. Uh, Branscombe Richmond uh, was the stunt coordinator. But he was an actor, right? too. I'm pretty sure he was in Renegade. He right. was. And he was, he would also, where else was he? Would Steven you Seagal movies. Steven did. Seagal movies. You would, I guess he was American Indian. Right. I don't, I don't know. But big he, guy, big guy. He would pop up now and again as the sidekick. Renegade, you know, Hawaiian Heat, Chuck, part of the city. Like Chuck Norris movies, <laughs> TV shows. And that and that kind of stuff. And when I saw him as a stunt coordinator, I'm like, that's that's uh, that's Renegade yeah, sidekick. Right. Yeah, yeah. So he, I guess he was actor stuntman, right? And so you got him, or somebody got him, TWI and Four Point to and Goldwyn to be the guy who set up the the gags essentially, or the games and things, right? Yeah, just to get the pilot. But they're just doing it on the dirt floor, right? Okay, yeah, yeah. They, I remember they, uh, we had one girl. Actually, the one girl I can't do that. Gina or something. She starred on uh, the movie with the hell was his name? I'll think of it in a minute. But she's she, um, pet detective. Oh, remember the girl with the little dog? Yeah, her. She was one of the gladiators in the very beginning. G- uh, I can't remember her name. We'll figure it out. With and the and uh, so you know, but we end up getting. You know, we have three guys and three girls, and I think maybe one or two end up staying for a while. But then th- out of that whole series, I think they narrowed it down to maybe like about seven or eight minutes, and that's when they went off to Napty with that. Hmm. And it was not an initial hit, ratings-wise. No, no. At least so says Netflix. Well, it was uh, 1 o'clock in the morning. It was one, like a 1 o'clock show. It was actually supposed to be up against Saturday Night Live. But somehow, you know, it found a niche, you know, and and that's when in the beginning they had the guys with the mask and the axe and the thumbs down. I'm going, oh, my God, what did they do? You know, now, now um, before the pilots, I was going to bring it back just a touch. Uh, you said in the documentary that you were at a moment where you were just you thought you were, you would be willing to sell your soul to the devil to get this. All right. I'm, that, that's really a great story. So yeah, what, what was that? For After like about seven years, I'm knocking on doors, knocking on doors. And I'm at room 302 at the Sheraton Universal or room 342 at the Sheraton Universal. I was going to say. Yeah, room 342 <laughs> at the Sheraton Universal. And, I and correct you. Pardon? I didn't want to correct you, but... <laughs> 
Yeah. Like I said, I my, knew you got I, the wrong room. Yeah. Uh, room 342. And 302 was Telly's mom's room. <laughs> yeah. That's mama's room. Telly yeah. was up at the penthouse, but go ahead. Now, actually, he was around the corner and he had a two bedroom, uh, two bedroom suite, him and Julie. His wife Julie, was Julie. I'm yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> or so, so, um, because if you remember, they put the store way in the back in the corner. I don't, all I remember is that there was a, Sports bar in the basement yeah. on the first floor, like lower than the lobby, called Tell. That's impressive. Yeah. yeah. And that I remember. So so I'm knocking on doors. I'm knocking on doors. And I'm starting to think, geez, you know, I I've, don't know which more I can do. I mean, my son's growing up without me. You know, I'm leaving my home. I had that golds running, you know. And on, on the air comes, oh, God, you devil. And with George Burns, and I forgot the other guy's name. He was a young singer named Billy. Old God was a movie starring George Burns where he right. played God, and I think they made a sequel. Oh God, you devil! Which was the sequel to <laughs> Oh God, uh, that was George Burns and John Denver. No, I swear uh, to God, John Denver was in. That was another. Oh one. God, that was another one. It was another Oh God, but Oh John God, Denver you devil was in Oh God. Oh God, you devil was the sequel, and it had the guy who was the rock and roll star, right? Yeah. Wow. He was you, a I rock think Oh God, you devil was the third one because there looks like to be an Oh God book two as well. <laughs> yeah. So why you said wow. singer? I thought it was John Denver, but yes. he was in the first one. Yeah. Uh, so and the, the guy is a struggling singer. He was kind of going through the same thing as I was going through, trying to be known and get his music out there. And he meets and he meets the, the George Burns played the devil as well as God. <laughs> so he ends up meeting George Burns the devil. And, and he, George says, hey, kid, why don't you sign with me? And he says, no, I, I, I don't want to. And, and he says, if you sign with me, they'll do movies, there'll be tours, there'll be posters. And he says, okay. So he signs his name. They go into this room. And the, the head of the company says, this is incredible. We'll do movies. We'll do tours. We'll do posters. And I said, you know, God, I'd sell my soul right now to the devil if that would happen to me. And next day I'm meeting with Ronnie Ziskin from Four Point Entertainment. And I go in with my radio, you know, and, I, and I'm sitting in a chair like my knees are in my throat, you know, and there's like seven guys around and he's sitting behind his big desk and he pulls out the folder and he puts it down. And I said, what do you think? He said, this is fantastic. He says, we'll do movies, we'll do tours, we'll do posters. He said, what do you think, Johnny? I said, did you ever see Oh God, You Devil? <laughs> he said, he says, no, why? I said, I think I sold my soul to the devil yesterday. And that's kind of what happened on that. And I told that to Ron, and and uh, he said, I never knew that. You know, and he well, says, wait, Ron is? Ziskin, four point, president of Four Point Entertainment. Right. And when I talked to Ron, he says, you know, Johnny, every time you do an article, you never, ever mention me. And I says, Ronnie, I promise you the next time I do, I will. Well, Ron passed away. And when we were doing the documentary, I told the director, I says, you know, I want to say something. Well, the director says, well, did he did he rip you off and he started getting negative? I said, no. I said, I owe everything to Ron Ziskin. Did you, know? you uh, was the doc in your mind, like, were you sort of set up? I mean, was yeah. it like a uh, it was piece? It was a hit piece, yeah. It was, I was sold one thing and, you know, it was just so far off the truth. You know, I mean, right down to that book. It is. You know, uh, I mean, everything. Uh, it's just like for the Elvis, imper you know, I was approached as an Elvis impersonator. Yeah, I did that like when I was 26. I was they going. said in the Netflix one that you showed up dressed like that's Elvis. Not true. And that's not true. jumped up and down on the trampoline. Do I look like I'm a guy that's going to jump up and down on the trampoline? Come on. Well, see, <laughs> the whole thing about the kind of new world order is I don't know if people are lying anymore or they just think that's what happened this is a big problem it's all personal truths it, it, i mean well look i bring it up all the time it's like you, yes. you just had britney spears explain that she got pushed and knocked to the ground right. and then we see the film and she gets pushed and not knocked to the ground yeah. and that was her memory from 10 minutes earlier imagine when 10 years or 20 years goes by and then start thinking about all the me too shit that's out there like yeah. he did this and then he did that you have these 
people are like he shows up, he dresses Elvis, he jumps up and down on the trampoline. We never t- had even had a trampoline. To I mean, get I don't off know. of the trampoline, then no. he gets behind the tennis ball gun and he starts shooting that. Eventually, we have to stop him from doing it. Right. I never even was near that cannon. <laughs> Never, because it was it was like eight nine feet in the air, you know. Yeah, to climb up the scaffolding. I, 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 listen, that's not me. I mean, even when Ben Berman says, "Well, let's <clears throat> let's go shoot on the beach," I said, "I hate the beach. I don't like the beach," you know. And, and uh, it's like a, I'll tell you straight. I mean, I, I have nothing to hide on anything. You know, it's just some things I like to do, some things I don't like to do. I don't like the beach, and then they had me walking down Hollywood Boulevard in the middle of COVID. And, and and uh, I didn't want to do that, but I did it. I, they said, "Well," I said, "I said, all right, I'll be a good sport and I'll go along with you guys and do what you want." But I had no idea that they were t- trying to do this. Right, like the whole it became kind of like searching for Dan Carr. There was that bullshit. Like, it, but the uh, um, after the success of the Gladiators, did you or Dan take any legal action? Was there uh, um, with with each other? No, like, no. We, we, we no, 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 I, we were friends. I mean. You well, know, just because he seems so bitter about it, like compared, like when you when you know he's portrayed. No, because you know, it wasn't like that at all. I mean, Danny, it's just then this thing about when he was in Las Vegas, he wanted to kill me or something like right. that. That never happened. I mean, you know, I think what happened with Dan, I think he had a lot of peer pressure from people, but he wouldn't tell them that he sold it. You know, and I think a lot of that's what happened. And and you know, I'm in Vegas. I'm I'm trying to do a huge show. I was working with like the Imperial Palace. We were doing. I was talking with dealing with MGM, Luxor. They were building Luxor and you know Grand Slam Canyon and stuff. And finally, you know, I was at the Imperial Palace and Dan shows up. You know, and and I had my son there. My son was there, and I said, "Hey, Danny, what are you doing here?" Well, I, you know, I come out to see you, and I said, "All right." And I never knew that because we ended up going to dinner and stuff and whatever and. And then I end up paying his hotel bills. And I'm thinking, why would you show? It's just like he would just show up when he had no ownership, no right to the show. He wasn't involved in the show. Even in 19, I have the, the paperwork here, it says from 1984, was not involved in American Gladiators at all. Who made all the money off of American Gladiators? It wasn't a lot of money. That's what I understand. I was only making 2000 and Well, episode. I don't mean between you and Dan. Oh, uh, somebody. Gold, gold, gold one. Gold one. They made just millions and millions oh, off yeah, it. Oh, yeah. They made a lot of money, yeah. Yeah, it was, it was syndicated, you know, and I was getting, you know, and Dan didn't understand. So he come to me and he says, John, I'm not making any of Danny. I said, here's what I'm making, but I said, understand, I'm paying for my own legal fees. And you know legal fees aren't cheap. Oh, know? yeah. I was paying legal fees. I, I was paying my own transportation, my own hotel bills. I was paying everything. You know, went on tour, I had, did my own bus. I, I did everything out of my pocket. Not to mention when I already had invested in the interest on that. So, but I said, Dan, here's what I'll do. I said, I'll give you so much an episode. And he agreed to it. And and I signed an agreement with that, too, that he signed. And, you know, I've kept that word 100% on everything I owed. And then I heard that. And, t- and later on, uh, he uh, gets a heart attack. And I heard that. And I thought, you know, I just, I would get nightmares. I actually had nightmares. I'd wake up. I says, I got to call Dan. I, I, this is crazy. We're not talking anymore. So I had a friend of mine reach out because I, re- I said, Dan, I knew that if I was going to come in here, you'd probably die and want to kill me right, right on the bed. So, so I had a friend of mine call him, and I met Dan at a restaurant, and I brought him a peace pipe, you know, because he's like this real diehard Apache, you know, um, and because uh, that meant a lot to him. And uh, five minutes, we were like brothers again, you know, it was just incredible. And we were good. And that's why everybody kept saying, well, the ESPN documentary ends well. Didn't end well. You know, we were already friends before. Uh, and, and, and Dan says, I have no regrets. You know, he said, I'm not a victim. And the director stood up and says, I guess I got the story wrong. Because Dan told me that. And instead of the guy saying, you know, listen, we went down this wrong direction. It's not true about John. He didn't say that. He let me hang out there. Hmm. Yeah. Well, anybody who remembers the whole Michael Jackson victim thing with uh, Mark Gergos, attorney. Yeah. That sequence when Mark 
I'll kind of paraphrase it, but find it. somebody had planted a recording device on a private jet that Mark and Michael Jackson were in, I think going from Vegas back to Neverland or somewhere in there. And they record it. And so in the doc, they show one of the young victims saying, you know, we were told we couldn't talk or whatever. And then they cut to Mark Garagos, who's representing Michael Jackson. And he's going, if we find out that anyone's done anything or said anything, we will crush you. We'll crush you. Well, he was, wasn't was talking about kids coming forward. He was talking about the person that planted the recording device on the airplane. And the people that made the doc knew all yeah. about it. They had they all had the they, they had all the raw footage, yeah. and they just edited it to make Mark Garagos look like if any eight year old comes forward and talks about being molested, we will destroy your life. Well, that's kind of what they did here. That's, that's but but I'm saying keep in mind, people, when you watch docs, yeah. unless I make the doc, oh, yeah. <laughs> but when you watch everyone else's doc, understand it can be cooked quite yeah, because, quite a bit because when. Um, because in my agreement, because Dan would just go call up the paper and say, I'm pissed off. And then they print stuff that I said, why would you do that? So in our agreement, we, we had a hush clause where we just couldn't do that. And um, so they put that same agreement in my agreement with Vice that they just can't go out and do this. So after a while, I end up calling. And, and if you see on that, he says, well, where's Dan Carr? And I kind of said, hold it right there, because they told me to say that. They said, if there's something wrong that you don't want us to touch on, just say, hold it. And they kept it in there like I did something wrong, you know. Yeah. All right. We need to, uh, well, we have, all right. We need to take a break, but I have the Garagos, I think it's an A and B with the uh, Jackson right. trial edited footage. Uh, Johnny Ferraris, uh hanging. I'll ask many more questions about American Gladiators right after this. Let me tell you about Angie, homeowners. You know, it's a lot of work to own a home. Whether it's uh, everyday maintenance, repairs, or dream projects, it can be hard to even know where to start. All you need is Angie. Your home for everything home. Find a skilled local pro who will deliver quality and experience. Over 20 years of home service experience. Bring them your project online or with the Angie app. Answer a few questions and Angie handles the rest. Look, you're busy. You don't have time to do all this stuff. Let Angie handle it. Take care of just about any home project in just a few taps. Download the free Angie mobile app today or visit online. Visit Angie.com. That's A-N-G-I dot com. A-N-G-I dot com. That's Angie. Let them do all the heavy lifting. Apartments.com helped millions of renters find their perfect places, and they're all different because none of us are the same. So why should our homes be? Apartments.com has the right tools to help you find the place that's uniquely perfect for you. Sort through and filter listings by amenities, and don't miss out on their instant alert option. With over a million available units for rent, you'll find the place that's right for you. Whether you're looking for a place with a basement, a yard, or a pool, apartments.com. That's apartments.com, the place to find a place. Jenny Ferraro here, creator of American Gladiators, a show. Uh, look, take it all with a grain of salt, but uh, the 30 for 30 was riveting, and uh, so was the Netflix. The number one syndicated show at the time. Yeah, and just, uh, like I said, a real stamp for what was 1992 and L.A. like. Watch watch that show. Uh, we have the aforementioned uh, Mark Garagos trial edited footage that will play. Uh, I don't know. Is this the A and the B one? Must be. Okay. We'll figure that out. We will land on you like a ton of bricks. We will land on you like a hammer. If, if you, you do, do anything, anything to besmirch this man's reputation, anything we will to intrude on his privacy in any way that's actionable, we will unleash a legal, legal torrent, torrent like, like you've, you've never, never seen. seen. All right. Michael called. Yeah. So they basically just edited it to seem like we'll crush you if you say he molested you, not you secretly recorded him and his attorney. 
Yeah. And that's supposed to be taken as fact. I, well, people look at docs uh, like they're reading a transcript yeah. from an official court proceedings or something. Right. They have no idea how much... I. I mean, it borders on a kind of... I, I think when you make a documentary, you have a sort of fiduciary duty because you're presenting it as a documentary. You know, if you're going to make Guardians of the Galaxy, then by all means, do whatever you want creatively. But when you present things like documentaries, then your audience sits there and goes, okay, this is how it how it plays out. Right. And the reality is... is who knows how often this happens? I mean, you would never know this Gergus thing if Gergus didn't start screaming about it to right. a microphone. Um, so that's that's where we're at now as a as a society. So uh, American Gladiators, um, the tour, because we have another friend, David Fishaw. Oh yeah, David, <laughs> who does the comedy camp? We're comedy doing fantasy comedy camp. fantasy camp. Yeah. I'm doing with Leno coming up, but who also does obviously the rock and roll fantasy camp i don't know how he gets reeled in or how he becomes part of the story for the live show that's a great story well let's hear it so <clears throat> i was doing a show <clears throat> and uh and when i'm on stage there's this little girl and she's looking at me with binoculars and i stopped the orchestra because i had a, it was a pretty big show and i stopped the orchestra you're doing a show where you're singing right right Oh, because and, David was in the music business. Well, it back in the day. Yeah, but he wasn't there. So, um, the little girl, she, she, I says, "Why are you sitting in the front row looking at me with binoculars?" And she said, "Sir," I said, "Call me Johnny." She says, "Johnny, sir." She says, "I'm blind." I said, "Oh." So, I knelt down and I was talking to her, and you could like hear the ice melting in the glasses. The room just got boom, real quiet, and. And she says, will you do me a favor? I says, sure. She says, can I feel your face? I want to see you. So she started to touch my face. And and so years later, I'm driving along, and I get a call from this guy named Skip Wade. And he says, is this John? I went by Johnny C. He says, is Johnny C? I says, yeah. He said, I'm the coldest son of a bitch in the world. He says, I got to know. He says, was that little girl a plant? I says, no. I says, I never met her before. He said, you had me crying that night. So I go to Boston. I, I meet this guy, Skip. You know, we become good friends. And he was a truck driver for U2. Mm -hmm. He did the, the tour. Did the tour. Oh, yeah. And, and he was doing the Happy Together tour with David Fishoff, the, the monkey tour. So, and I says, you know, I've always wanted to do a Gladiator tour. He said, listen, I know someone that does that. And I said, Here's what I'll do. If you give me the guy's name, we do a tour. I promise you'll have the, the trucking contract. So he gave me David Fishoff's number. I called David, go to New York. We hammer out, a, you know, we go get uh, go, Samuel Goldwyn involved, you know, and we do this deal and we line up a tour. And But David was booking rock and roll stuff. And, and rock and roll mentality, if they don't sell it like in an hour, they get like really scared promoters. So I said, David, I said, this needs to be like the circus. This is a big walk up. So he goes out and, and he gets uh, Feld Entertainment, Kenny Feld. And he brings Ken Feld into it. So now it's really massive and they're doing, we're selling out the garden. We're doing a 114 city tour. And it was just massive. And it actually drove the ratings, like tripled the ratings. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. Well, that's what I tell even MGM now. I says, you know, what we want to do as soon as you do a show, you want to follow up with the tour. And then back in 2008, we, were, we had a deal with AEG to go out and, and do a big tour. And because, you know, you're taking the stars right to the people and you're seeing it. And, you know, it was pretty much how, uh, what is it, uh, um, uh, Star Search or that, what's that other show? Idol. American Idol. Yeah. yeah, that's what they were doing. But I, we started that. Oh, right. Nin oh, yeah. yeah, 1991, you know. And I, and I went to Goldwyn. I says, guys, because they were spending a million dollars on doing contestant search. I says, we'll just take the winners out of each city and we'll make them the contestants for television. So that's what they were competing for. And it was just great. I mean, it was just wonderful. Yeah. Walk up, for those who don't know the lingo, it just means, you know, Taylor Swift sells all her tickets. Nobody yeah. shows up. Yeah. With yeah. 50 bucks and goes, I expect a good seat. <laughs> different time, Swift. different day. Yeah. But if you went to the circus, you would walk up. 
Yeah, go up or, to the window. Go up you to the just window. walk. You just walk up. So you're that kind of business is walk up versus right. Taylor Swift business. They said one's rock and roll, one's a circus. They're they're just two different mentalities on stuff. Yeah, yeah you buy all your U two tickets uh, three right. months in advance. Right. So. so oh. Go ahead. Well, in both documentaries, uh, the gladiators talk about building resentment over not making any money through the merchandising yeah, and contracts. Well, yeah, so we're, I didn't we're, get any merchandising either. Right. You know, so you know, I don't know what everybody's complaining about. I didn't get it either. <laughs> you know, what they would do, they would take all, everything from the shows except the tour. You know, but all the merchandising, all the ancillaries, it all go into a pot. And then what would happen? Say the show cost ten million dollars to make, they get it down to about two million dollars when it's just about to break even. And then they add the following year on top of it. Now you're back into 10 million in the hole again. And that kept going and going and going and going. And that's what happened with that. You know, but these guys gave me 25 grand for two weeks work. Would you, and don't forget, we're going back 30 years. Right. What's that worth today? 50, $60,000. Would you make 50, 60 grand in two weeks? Wouldn't you do it? I'd be okay with that. Oh, you'd be okay with that, right? <laughs> that's what the gladiators got paid. Yeah. That's what they got yeah, paid. But, Not to mention, they went on the tour and they were making three to five thousand a week with no expenses. And then they would do personal appearances. They kept all the money. They get sponsorships. They kept all the money. And Lori Frederick, she's on Rich and the Famous, the the Robin Leach Rich and Famous, saying I made all this money from American Gladiator. Which one is she? Zach? Ice. 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 Then she's the ones complaining the most. Well, you know, and so there's kind of two schools of thought, which is because I used to work for MTV. And I used to work for K-Rock Radio. Like, MTV's thing was sort of like, mm, hey, Carson Daly, we're not going to pay you, but we'll make you a star, and then you can go parlay that into whatever you want. Like, I did, we did Love Line on MTV, which was supposed to be the syndicated NAPTI show that ended up on MTV. And then Drew and I would go out on weekends and play colleges. So we got paid not very much from Mark Itkin and company over at uh, right. Stone Stanley Productions. We got paid okay, but really we want, our thing was to go out and get paid off of that. So it's kind of, sort of like saying... Um, it's almost used as a promotion device for your other endeavors. If you were doing, let's, let's say you were a regular on Gutfeld now, you might not get paid that much, but then you go out and sell out theaters and do your comedy or write right. a book or whatever it is. So there's kind of, you know, there's two schools of thought. One is, as well, how much is Fox making or how much is Gutfeld making or how much is whatever American Gladiators making. On the other hand, you're getting paid and then you can go gig off of that right. or not. I mean, you don't, you may not. They just couldn't go out as Gladiators. They couldn't use their American Gladiator name, you know, because uh, that's owned by MGM. Or right. Goldwyn, you know, so that. were they sort of, was Goldwyn the kind of heavy here and you became the fall guy? Well, even I, from what I understand, even on, on the, uh, the Netflix, they says it was Sam Goldwyn that says you're fired, you're not doing that. And it, I had nothing to do with that. I, I signed a contract, I gave them these rights, and I would be there. And I'd, you know, my thing is even now, you know, I, I get involved in, in certain things of, the, uh, of, you know, the consultation on stuff. But while the show's going on, I'm talking to Caesar's Palace. I'm talking to other people of what we're going to do later. You know, that's what I really like doing. You know? What's the status of American Gladiators? Well, I I hear it's funny because I met with them uh, last night and uh, who's, M who's MGM them? MGM. Oh, for like a live show? No, no, and because uh, I just wanted to touch base with them and kind of tell them what's happening. And they just got done filming uh, the UK. And uh, it, it, it's it's a huge show, show over there. Wait, uh, what is the UK? UK Gladiators. Oh, MGM. Yeah, yeah MGM. Yeah. Just we were talking about Vegas and MGM. I was thinking of the resort. Yeah, no, is, no, it no. A, is it a revival in the UK, or has it always been going? Oh no, no, it, it it's come and gone. You know, Gladiators. It'll it'll air for so many years, and it'll come back, and then it'll you know take a break, and then it'll come back again. This is the third time. You know, so they just did a huge show over there, and went just crazy. And um, the hosts of the show um, are uh, uh, Bradley Walsh and Barney Walsh. So those are the new hosts of the show uh, on the BBC, and uh, that'll air in January. Oh, and the, yeah, the other host, the original host was Fran Tarkington. No, that was here. Here, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, I'm talking UK. No, I understand what you're saying. I'm saying the original host here. 
Oh, yeah, with Joe Theismann. We had Fran Tarkington. Todd Christensen. Todd Christensen, yeah. Chris doesn't know Todd Christensen. And Mar- Marisa Marlowski. I, I was only watched the Ryan Seacrest era. Todd Christensen was a probably a Hall of Famer uh, tight end for the Raiders. Great. Yeah, he's a big guy. Great tight end. Uh, died, by the way, 56. Looked him up. Fran Tarkenton, still alive, by the way. You know Fran Tarkington? Yeah, from the Netflix doc. <laughs> Larry oh, Zonka. Okay. We had Larry Zonka. Oh, yeah, Larry Zonka. Oh, yeah, he's... The, the straight James Von Prague. So, um, what's, so what's the status, what's the U.S. status of American Gladiators? Well, you know, um, they're out every day. They're, they're, they're trying to put things together. They want to relaunch the show again. It seems and, like there'll yeah. be an appetite for it. There oh, is. yeah, there is. I mean, people love Gladiators. I mean, I always say, listen, it's been around since Christ. We're not going anywhere. You know, um, people just like that. And it's, you know, in one year, I kind of 22 uh, competition shows on television. You know, and, you know, the, a guy I really admire was, was, was uh, Ben Silverman. When, yeah. he was, when he was in NBC, he says, you know, instead of going out and trying to do a show like American Gladiators, let's just get American Gladiators. That's when it aired. And I think we had like a six rating or something. It was, it was you know, and it was big. I mean, we were at Sony, and then from Sony, we had to go to the L.A. Forum. Would you do a reimagined 2023 version of it, or would there be a kind of nostalgic throwback vibe to it? I think you got to have a little bit of both. You know, you get, you know, people, they love to say, Hey, you know, this is what it was like, but you have to add, you know, either different games or more technology and things like that to it. I think, I think they have been thrown around uh, having more professional athletes as gladiators Mm-hmm. That kind of thing, and and still going up against the everyday working guy, but you're you know your your show is only as good as your competitors, you know as your contestants. You know, back then in in the early classic, they were big contestants. They were tough guys. We did two thousand and eight. They they weren't they weren't that big at all. You know, and uh, they start going to the pool and doing the water. And I said, "Why are you guys doing water?" He says, "Well, there's another show um, that that's." And they end up being wipeout, right. you know, and uh, which is like the gong show on water. And, and uh, you know, it was just a, a huge expense. And it, Gladiators is an expensive show to, show to shoot. Oh, yeah. Do you remember uh, Joe's versus Schmoes? Joe versus, yeah, Joe's versus um, Schmoes. There was a TV show. I remember. And Joe was- versus Pros. Oh, Joe's versus pros. Oh, yeah, That's right. Bros. Yeah. yeah, Joe's versus pros. Right. Yes, that is right. Kind of watchable. It's just a dude saying, um, oh, I could beat so and so in the boxing, you know, ring or whatever. And uh, oh, you got to go up against the pro. Go up, go up against the pro. Yeah. yeah. That kind of that element. But yeah. I got to say, in a world where I turn on Netflix and I'm watching a stupid show that says, uh, is it cake? <laughs> and I'm looking at a tackle box and trying to figure out whether it's made of cake or it's an actual tackle box. I'm like, I'd rather see guys run into each other yeah. and have a, get a little action going here. Yeah, but that net, net Netflix, <clears throat> excuse me, Netflix thing just, um, you know, I, I was surprised by it. Because, you know, one time these guys were on a first-name basis with the world. You right. know, they were big stars. And now they're 30 years later trying to air their laundry and pour me, pour that. And... You know, and they still don't know the story. They're out there still talking about how this thing started, and they're still getting it wrong. And well, do you do you feel <clears throat> like now more than ever with two running simultaneous docs on the same subject that if you can't yeah. get it, if you can't get the next version of this thing sold, it ain't going to happen. Like this is the time to do it. Well, they're working hard on it. You know, um, it's it's really hard to get a show of this size because. You know, you have to get the networks involved. It's it's everything's budget today, you know, and and you don't know whether to go to you know to the the networks or go to like you know streaming or it's just expensive to do, yeah. you know. And you, what you about th- the director who seemed crazy? Bob Levy. Bob Levy. Yeah. Is he as he crazy fun. as he seems? You know, you know, Bob. You know, he he. I mean, he was a great director. He really was. I mean, because he was. He you go into the into the, into the booth, and he's got like this rooster hat on or something, you know. And he had like a different thing every day. But but I don't understand all this burping he was doing all the time. I just didn't understand that. Well, he was. He liked the porn out. He like, was pretty the, passionate, dude. 
Yeah. He, he was he a good guy. I, I like Bob. Bob was a good guy. You know, you know, it was like family. You know, uh, for a couple weeks out of the year, it was like family. You get did this every week, you know, or every year, and you look forward to seeing everyone. You know, and, and me and the gliders, we were always close. Even on tour, we were always close. And But as time went on, they start trying to, you know, use gladiator names, trying to use the, you know, the, the copyrights and all the other things. And, and a lot of people that went off to do Netflix were the ones that were put on notices. You can't do this. You can't do mm-hmm. that. And they just, this was their way, I guess, of getting revenge or something. Well, if, if American Gladiators um, gets picked up, which I'm, I'll say when, too, because I, there is an appetite for this. Oh, yeah. Do you see yourself working with any of the old Gladiators? No. Uh, no, because they're a lot older now, and you know, you, like in any capacity, though, just as a host or, I don't think so. Yeah, you know. I don't think so. Even Malibu, <laughs> you know, I love Darren. Darren's such a cool guy. You know, um, you know, I don't know where you'll fit in. I mean, he he couldn't compete, and and I don't, you know, because I think they want more. I don't know uh, if you're a host that you've done hosting. I mean, even Ryan Seacrest, we started him when he was 16. He did G2000. Really? Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I wrote, it's funny because it took me like seven or eight years to get the show on the air. And I wrote Sam Gold in the letter. I said, dear Sam, I says, I have an idea for a kid show. Uh, and I said, let's make it educational. This way before the contestant can go on to the next event, he has to answer a question. And he, and I says, and the counselors will be the gladiators and we'll use the same set. We'll do everything. They'll be like minimal money. And he writes me back and says, okay. <laughs> you know, was it. And that was 16-year-old Ryan Seacrest? And the host of the show, Google it up, it's called Gladiators 2000. Yeah. And Ryan Seacrest, you know, uh, was, was the host of the show. He was thin oh. kid with curly hair. Yeah. And, and he did a great job. I mean, I think it kind of, you know. Uh, launched his launched career. Yeah, I think. But he did a great job. The, uh, the doc is the 30 for 30 doc. The American Gladiators documentary, ESPN Plus. There is. And uh, it's out as we speak. Highly recommend it. Just get lost in that yeah. world. Johnny Ferrar, we uh, must break, but uh, thank you for coming in here. Oh, you're welcome. I'm. Thank you for letting me uh, express my opinions on this thing here. That's what we do. Please, yeah. Uh, Payne Lindsay is going to be zooming in next. He's going to tell us why UFOs are real, and we'll do that right after this. First. There's the Jordan Harbinger Show. The Jordan Harbinger Show, a different kind of sponsor for this episode, the Jordan Harbinger Show. Well, if you're a fan of fascinating podcasts and interesting people, you should definitely check this one out. There's an episode for everyone, no matter what you're into. Jordan talks with Scott Adams about persuasion in a world where facts don't matter anymore. Man, is he right? Or you go inside the dark world of wildlife trafficking. You'll always find something useful to apply to your own life, like routine changes to boost productivity or slight mindset tweaks to change how you see the world. Jordan's a good guy. We've had him on uh, many times. I know the man well, and he's worth a listen. We enjoy the show, and we know you will, too. So you can search. The Jordan Harbinger Show, that is H-A-R-B as in boy, I-N as in Nancy, G-E-R, on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you listen to podcasts. Morgan and Morgan, let me lay a stat on you. People, 15 to 24, have the highest rate of ER visits due to car accidents. And uh, I got kids, and they're about that age, so it seems, well, they're right in that age group. It's kind of scary. So if you've ever been injured, check out Morgan & Morgan. Submitting a claim with Morgan & Morgan is easy. Uh, it's, you can use it the same way you use like a rideshare app. It is that easy. And even easier than swiping right on a dating app, which, by the way, leads to more trouble where this could lead to more money. America's largest injury law firm, 100-plus offices nationwide, over 800 lawyers, more than $15 billion recovered for clients. So if you're injured in an accident, check out Morgan & Morgan. Their fee is free unless they win, so it's no risk. Morgan & Morgan, right, Dawson? For more information, go to ForThePeople.com slash Adam or dial pound law, pound 529. From your cell phone, that's F-O-R, thepeople.com slash Adam or pound law, pound 529 from your cell. 
This is a paid advertisement. Payne Lindsay is joining us. He's a director, he's a podcast host as well. He's somewhere in Florida. Uh, High Strange is uh, the name of the podcast, wherever you find finer podcasts. And uh, they talk about firsthand stories of UFO cases. And now's the time. It's all happening. Good to see you, Payne. Likewise. How you doing? I'm well. You know, um, I tell anyone who'll listen, because I'm older than you guys, that this country was obsessed with UFOs all through the 70s. My entire childhood was discussions about UFOs and uh, shows hosted by Leonard Nimoy explaining that uh, they could be out there. Movies, there's a movie called uh, Chariots of the Gods from the 70s, and they'd go like the ancient pyramids. Could they have been built by an alien culture? And then they would show stick drawings inside of caves that was just like a stick man but he had a head that was a round circle they'd go could that have been a a space outfit and a helmet on their head and all we did was (laughs) talk about it that and the devil's triangle and now there's real credible evidence and footage from cockpits and nobody gives a shit yeah uh (laughs) what is going on back then i mean did, were you a believer and now you're you're feeling validated or, or what's your story no my story was is i was like i'd see a lot of grainy footage and stuff and it, it was sort of up there with the loch ness monster we had the loch ness monster at ufos and we had the, the devil's triangle bigfoot maybe yeah. Yeah. And, and bigfoot and so they would show up in movies and you know the six million dollar man would fight bigfoot and stuff like that like they're pretty ubiquitous and then they just sort of went away, and, and I was sort of in the skeptical camp. And now there's actual, and they talked about uh, Area 51. Yeah. And, and now, yeah, yeah. now there's credible evidence, and nobody my age seems to care. I think they're just not ready for it. I, I think that it's just easier to just move on. Like, not like ready is in the sense of you, you like, you got to do a job. You got to go to work tomorrow. I don't want to deal with this shit kind of thing, right? I I, I think it's everyone's supreme narcissism. And, or that. And that people are looking down at their phones versus up into the heavens. <laughs> when when I, And it sounds symbolic, but there was a lot of what's going on in the universe. Now there's like, what's going on on my phone? And you're just staring <laughs> down at it, yeah. reading shit about yourself. That's the most important thing these days, I guess, is your phone. But your phone's telling you that there's guys in Congress who are testifying under oath saying that there's been a decades-long uh, a UFO crash retrieval program. Basically, in layman's terms, there's been spaceships from outer space that have crashed here on Earth, and they have collected them and studied them. And with some of those crashes, there's been actual alien bodies Basically, the like the sci-fi movie in in its entirety in in real life, kind of. Well, yeah, on Independence Day, that was sort of chronicled, right? Welcome to yeah. Earth. And yep. so then the question would be, and and so also, so there's two there's two theories that were floated when I was young. One is is if there's ever aliens discovered and we do it, the world would sort of unite. Like we would realize that we'd stop fighting each other and stop pointing fingers at each other and realize we're all just humans on earth. And these guys were aliens and we needed to sort of come together. So a, it was going to stop every war. (laughs) Uh, B government was going to sort of go out the window because uh, who's going to pay their fucking quarterly taxes <laughs> next, yeah. next tax quarter when anymore. when we're doing battle with aliens. And so it would be sort of helter skelter. We had that. And then we also had the day we elect in the United States, the first black president will be the day racism is over in this country. Now, because you thought if we were evolved enough to have America all vote on a black president, then that'll be it with racism. Oh, we underestimated ourselves. We ratcheted the shit up yeah. after we did two terms <laughs> with the black president. And we've gone an equally disappointing direction with aliens <laughs> as well. 
<laughs> it's it's a it's a shame. I, I've, I my my the analogy these days is what would it take, right? Let's just say like hypothetically, an alien spaceship landed on the literal White House lawn, and on all news networks across the board, Biden comes out and shakes this alien's hand and says this news. Half the world would say this is fucking fake news. I mean, so it, it's like. Right. What, what would it take at this point anyway? So I think all this stuff's a pipe dream, and you're going to believe what you want to believe, but I think that seeing is believing, and science, if you're into that at all, which we should be, uh, supports that there's probably something else going on, right? So how do you, what is the explanation of like the cockpit, cockpit I should say, footage with these things doing things leaving no heat yeah. signature, Confusing moving the in a way that nothing we've made can move, go, going into the water and then, you know, coming back out again. Is there, and some people go, oh, it's Chinese or whatever. Then people go, Chinese, they rip all, they rip the technology off from us. So how could yeah. it be the Chinese? What's your take on like the cockpit footage? One, I wish it wasn't so blurry. I mean, like it's a shame that, an F-18 has that poor quality of camera. I, I think there's probably some better looking videos of it out there. Um, and if it was China, I, I mean, then isn't that like a bigger blunder? Didn't we just screw up all of our national intelligence for decades? Not that they made some advancement that we don't understand and we think it's aliens and it's not I, that. That to me would be a bigger story than right. it just being, "Hey, we're not we're not alone in the universe." Well, what based off of because um, for those who you've been on the show before, you've you've done some pretty high profile true crime podcasts and uh, investigations. So, based off of your uh, investigation on UFOs, what is the most damning evidence that you've come across that it's all real? To me, it's it's a, a combination of all of the. Former, nil, uh, milita former military pilots and personnel who are highly decorated, who have no good reason to make any sort of bizarre story up, especially if you go back to like the 80s or something. And they're swearing up and down today that they experienced something that is otherworldly. And even by today's technology, it does not make sense. And so if you just, if you want to listen to the people who, control and operate some of the most advanced uh, vehicles in the air in America, in the world, then uh, if you believe them, then there's something else going on. And so to me, it's, it's these stories. I mean, I could go into deeper ones like Travis Walton, who was missing for five days, who claims he was abducted. And, you know, I, I kind of look back at all these cases from a long time ago, and I'm like, I'm wondering now how many of them were actually true I wanted to believe them a long time ago because it was just a fun idea, but I'm starting to wonder if some of them were actually true the whole time and it wasn't as crazy as we thought it was. Well, they say, and I heard the guy give his testimony that they had a pilot that they found in a crash one. And when they say pilot, it's kind of maybe not traditionally as, as we'd think it, those who fly Southwest, but I just mean a organism or something and that they'd recovered it so where is it, and then who's got video of it or pictures of it, and when was it? I mean, that's the only problem with this guy's testimony, uh, David Grush, is that he isn't the guy coming forward who has the actual photos to show us, at least not apparently right now. He's someone who has been top-level clearance and talked to these people for you know almost a decade, and what's someone, it's the kind of guy who briefs the president here. And so he's heard all of these stories. So it's either one of two things in my mind. Either he's been gaslit by 40 plus people of high ranking in the military about this fictitious uh, space, spacecraft retrieval program for a decade, or it's just true. And I think that he believes it to be true. Also as a guy who his main job is to figure out deception and avoid it at all costs. Uh, he doesn't gain much by doing this today. And if he's proven to be a liar, he swore under oath and he can face prison time. 
Uh, it's just, I don't know. But, but we all want more. I mean, it's a big claim. So, you know, where are the pictures? We, you know, I think we should, we should think like that, I think. Well, the idea that just popped in my head is we're not the only people on the planet. You know, what about the Canadians? Forget Mexico. I don't know. I feel like they're going to screw this one up. But what about Europe? You know, if, if these crafts and these aliens are visiting places it wouldn't just be north america or the united states it it would cover a lot of ground and i could definitely see certain nations like china and russia and other sort of roguey kind of uh, north korea nations not wanting to be an open book with this stuff but i feel like there's a lot of nordic nations and canada and places like that that are pretty forthcoming like Something happens, they'll they'll tell you about it. Uh, are we hearing anything out of these other nations? I mean, the reality is these stories. It's easy to look at the whole alien UFO idea and and think of it as some American folklore, but it truly isn't. You know, we we grew up hearing that from our own radio stations and our own documentaries and stuff like that. But it really is a global phenomenon, and you know, places like Russia and China. Obviously, they're not, they're not going to divulge anything, but we're kind of the same way. We're not going to divulge anything either. And so there are other countries that have had stuff. And I don't know what's true and what isn't true, but there's tons of stories that I've heard of the U.S. government coming in. And, you know, let's say you know, there's a story about a, a craft that landed in Mexico. And I don't know if it's true or not, but uh, the U.S. government apparently came, swept in and, and took that damn thing. And so, I mean, also it sounds exactly like what we would do. Right. So there's probably a lot of that going on where, you know, trying to control what's going on in terms of the technology and how it's disseminated to the public. Um, but it's just, if it's a reality, if the reality is that we know for a fact that there are other intelligent life forms that have been here a lot, then we should just be able to know that definitively. That shouldn't be a secret. Keep doing your own studies or whatever, but don't uh, gaslight us anymore. We're tired, right? I wonder yeah. if we as humans, you know, what we do is we kind of graft on our own feelings. Like, you know, especially women, guys do it too. You know, women will go like, the dog is angry at you because you walked out of the room when the dog was looking. And they're like, that's you just grafting on your own shit. Onto the that dog. Rejection. The dog's yeah. a dog. He doesn't care. He doesn't. He only wants his food from you. You know. You heard. It was his, horny. It was yeah. It yeah. Was just a no. Yeah. You hurt his feelings. <laughs> you know. Like okay. So we graft right. So then what we do as the human race, we go. Man, if we had the technology to know that we could completely take over another group or a, another nation or something, like if we knew we could destroy them or take them, like, we would do it. And so then we just do. The math, like, well, if they have the technology to take us over, then they're going to try to take us over. But that's a human impulse. Yes. It may it may have nothing to do with their impulses. They may not even have impulses. But it's it's not grafting the sort of human. What we do is we do a math with, with everything that, that we like. You know, I can't even, if somebody tells me, I don't like pizza. I'd go, bullshit. You don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> I like pizza so much. Yeah, I don't even believe you. Like, like we just graft, right? So maybe there's an advanced civilization, and maybe they're not burdened with these horrible human foibles about taking shit over all the time or sort of might makes right. <laughs> like, even though they could enslave us because they have the technology, maybe they're not into that, which yeah. would be nice. It, it, we're the cavemen still, if right. that's true, right? It's like, I mean, I often joke about with my friends, you know, it, like have aliens advanced past, you know, wanting to take over the world, like even past masturbation? They're just, mm. they're just on some like absolute, they're just by the book facts. It's not even entertain. It, this, that's like an old, that's a, an old thought. That's like archaic, right? And I think that's, I mean, it sounds stupid, but I think there's probably some truth to that. If if you're that intelligent, I mean, if you've been around for a billion years or more, longer than we have, I mean, shit, you've done everything once, and it's it's probably not even it's not even the same game you're playing. 
Yeah, I hope that's their attitude. I hope <laughs> their attitude. Like, I have that same thing when I hear about like a guy who's like juggling five girlfriends. I'm like, isn't one enough trouble? Like, isn't one enough? Like, do you really want to enslave a planet? That's a that's a calorie burner, <laughs> man. A lot. Someone's gonna have to monitor this shit. I mean, we're gonna burn a lot of calories <laughs> enslaving humans. It's daunting. Um, so. Where are, so if you said to most, I guess if you said to most Americans when I was young, if UFOs were real, they would go, no, but a small group would say they were. I think now we're probably 50% plus, but the caveat is we don't care, but we just go, <laughs> yeah. it's real. Yeah, we, or they don't see them as a threat, so what, what's, the, what's the point of caring? I, they're every bit as big a threat as they potentially as they were in the 70s. Right. Uh, we just don't care. I really think, you know what I think a lot of it is? I, th- I think it's the, um, I think it's the Lance Bass syndrome. They're all gay. They're all gay. No, mm. before Lance Bass said he was gay, we all cared. Uh, like, come on, you know that dude is gay. You know that dude. And someone go, he's not gay. He's probably he's probably nailing tons of poon on the road. And then you're like, I know he's gay. And we all <laughs> knew he was gay, but he never said it. And then one day he said, I'm gay. And we're like, all right, we're all right. done. We're well, done with you now. There you go. <laughs> yeah. So who else do we say is gay that doesn't know they're gay yet? You're right. It's yeah. We, <laughs> we got to move on to the next guy who won't tell yeah. us he's gay. So <laughs> us <laughs> arguing over the existence of UFOs is what we wanted to do. That's what we liked. once we confirm there's UFOs, then we're all done. We're all like, what's next? We got to argue about something else. And I think that's kind of what's going on because people argued about it all through the 70s and now nobody cares. Yeah. And ironically, Lance Bass obsessed with space. Is he? Oh, that's right. There's like some connection. Yeah. Conspiracy? I mean, I don't know. So what do you... What do you consider the reason that we're seeing so much of it now? And has, do you think it's always been this often? Like, I, I'm seeing that the Pentagon received over 350 UFO sightings last year. I think that just the younger generation is, is you know, I, I feel like it's my, it's my, I'm 35. I feel like it's my grandparents and people of, of like that age who have been, just staunchly against this and, you know, maybe they're religious or whatever it is. And I think that there's been younger people in the system and the military F-18 pilots who've actually seen weird stuff and they've just fought for a while now to, to be heard. And, you know, I think they just, there's a big uh, New York times story years ago about just to kind of kick this whole thing off around COVID. And I think since then it's, it's like they've realized that, the general public doesn't really care that much in this, even in the sense of, yeah, sure. Tell me more. We're not as scared of it as you thought we were. And if you are, you're probably just denying what could be real. And so I think that we're at a point where maybe society just is just, you know, game for whatever or something. Um, Now I have uh, another theory that may help. All right, you guys know Joey Fatone, right? <laughs> no, no, this is a separate theory. Um, this theory is many young people who they survey now are like completely apathetic about everything. They're like, oh, we're not going to have kids. I don't even know if I want to own a home. Like this earth's going to end in 12 years. You know, I've been, they've been hearing so much doom and gloom about the planet and about how it's all going to be over, that literally there's, a, I mean, I'm sure they're all in blue states, but if you get hold of your average 15-year-old, you know, upper west side white chick who goes to a private school in, in Manhattan, it's going to be like, I'm not going to have kids. Why would I have kids? This shit's all going to be done by the time I'm 26 and a half, right? So we used to talk about the aliens taking over the planet, you know what I mean? But what planet? I mean, it. If you have even convince enough people this thing's done, then you're not going to have kids. You're not going to buy a house. Uh, you know the sea levels are going to rise and flood everybody. Then you would be much more apathetic mm-hmm. about somebody invading this place 
it's should, almost, yeah, it kind of becomes their problem. <laughs> now, like, all right, come here, come on in, alien, and help us uh, get rid of uh, carbon. But I, I think our problems are, are we that special? I, I thought we, we think we're so special. Yes. As if we have so much to offer them. They, like, I mean, what do the, what would they want? Yeah, that's a good we point. It's, it be, that's just a small, narrow minded thought that I think just kind of disrupts learning anything you knew you didn't know before. I would take, I would take the Grand Canyon in Bezos's yacht if I was coming here. Like, I'd be like, I like Monument Valley, Grand Canyon, Jeff Bezos yacht. Our three most beautiful things. And uh, see if I could actually flood the Grand Canyon, get Bezos' yacht in there. <laughs> that, no, that would be cool. Yeah. <laughs> that, that would be cool. But, you know, as I think about it, half the country is religious and probably thinks UFOs are false. And the other half are nutty environmentalists who probably think this whole shit house is burning up anyway. So who cares? So that leaves a small group of us in the middle to do the to do the caring. <laughs> it does. It, 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 like it has to happen right now. We have to be able to talk about it. But most people, they got to go to work tomorrow. They don't want to deal with all this stuff. I, I don't want to, even, even if they believe it or they're partial to it, I don't want this disruption in the way that I have thought the world is for my entire life. I got to go do some shit at work tomorrow. It's like, I think there's a lot of that where it's like, okay, yeah. I'll, I'll wait it out and see what we discover. I think that there's something to this, but you know, let me know when y'all figure it out. But here we are talking about it because there are people who just don't want to even look at it because it pokes that belief system button, whatever it may be, religion or whatever else. Well, you know what it, what it would kind of take, I think, is Hollywood celebrities, you know, getting vocal and getting into it like you know you take something in this country you take something like black lives matter and you go all right it's not enough for them just to do it you need lebron james tweeting about it you need celebrities tweeting about it you need people with juice with heat with juice with heat like the the folks that do all the shaping of the cultural landscape you know really getting behind something uh, we did it with COVID. Uh, we did it with Black Lives Matter. Like, like when when the cultural folks start getting involved, then everybody gets involved. The tastemakers, you know, the yeah. Oprahs of the world, you know, and they seem kind of strangely silent on this one. I have not heard a lot of them speak out a lot. Like if, if you got Oprah and LeBron like going at this one hard, Taylor Swift, perhaps, you know. It would get, it would get out there. Yeah, there'd be some it, concern. There'd be there'd be more interest in this. Uh, instead, there's not much coming out of those camps, or maybe I'm, maybe I'm mistaken, but I just don't. No. I don't hear anything out of yeah. out of those. Who are like, the biggest celebrities? If, if the Obamas really got into this, mm. it, I think it they, would I get think traction. They are, though I think they, I mean, I don't know that like literally, but I know that they're working on some documentary i think it's for netflix or something about the betty and barney hill case from the 60s which is like a very almost impossible to debunk ufo abduction case of uh, in, in american history and you know if you look at any of if you just google obama uh youtube obama ufo anytime he's talked about it it's it feels like a little bit of that wink wink i don't think he knows everything but he's definitely not shooting it down <laughs> Well, so, what was this case? The UFOs landed in uh, whatever the Flintstones hometown is and abducted Betty and Barney. <laughs> yeah, Betty and Barney. Yeah, it's unreal. It sounds, it, I mean, it sounds made up at this point. Uh, I mean, logline is uh, early 60s, uh, Betty and Barney Hill, an interracial couple. They claim to have been abducted and they had this bizarre, long, hour stretching story of being on this spacecraft. And it's just been this very hard and almost impossible to debunk story. And there's physical evidence of marks on their car and stuff that happened with the clock in the car. And nothing's ever been able to disprove it. And if you really kind of look at 
the case, which I like some of these older cases sometimes because you can go just Google 1963 and find out exactly what was going on that day in that time period, what technology there was. And there really is no good reason for them to make this up. Uh, It would have only made their lives more difficult. And their testimony is just absolutely horrifying. And it's either the best acting job, no matter what, they believe what happened to them happened. And I don't think that they were bullshitting. They claim they were both abducted for five days, did you say? No, they were uh, for hours. They were both on this spacecraft and they they both came back to their house and they started kind of remembering little bits and pieces of this encounter and eventually got to the point where they were talking to a hypnosis person, which you know sounds a little hoodoo already, but this guy basically just unpacking their memories. And in separate rooms, they basically recall the exact same things. Mm. And so e- either way, science has not been able to explain what they experienced that they thought was real. You could say, okay, yeah, it wasn't real then. All right, well, there's still something else going on. This isn't some big act. So, are, are they with us anymore? Uh, unfortunately, no, they're not. Um, yeah, it's uh, it, I, like I said, there's two parts. There's the part that's super interesting that this may actually be happening. And then the other part where nobody cares that it's actually happening. Both, both interesting to me, but I'm, I'll, I'll, I'll say on a hopeful note that they won't possess all the horrible human tendencies and, uh, somehow there'll be a, 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 a magnanimous culture that'll want to share their, uh, their technology with Fingers us. Fingers crossed. Yeah. Fingers cross uh pain it strikes me speaking of pilots in the air and and makes me think of golfer Payne stewart Mm -hmm. were you named after him i was not uh growing up that was like the only other pain i feel like in existence uh r.i.p i never Mm -hmm. watched him play golf but it's actually my mom's maiden name Uh, um sucked growing up it was like a pain in the ass and i'm like yeah you know sure i heard it but now it's like, oh, this is just, you know, I haven't met another pain yet. If I do, I kind of want to beat that guy's ass. I don't, I don't want there to be another pain. That yeah. sounds annoying. Pain has that horrible plane crash. Do you know that story? No. Do you know the yeah. story, Payne? Uh, well, you must. I, I, you must know it. I haven't seen the, uh, the autopsy photos, but I <laughs> heard that it was a fiery flame that he went down in. He was, uh, the, was it one of those small planes? Because those, was, those, are the, those was are the sketchy a, ones. It was a private jet. And it depressurized, and everyone was passed out, and oh, the plane no. and the plane was just flying for like another three hours. I did hear about that, and they were having to track it and stuff. They knew it was just going to go until it ran out of gas. Right. And the thing that is kind of crazy when you hear about that kind of stuff, we always you always picture it crashing into a schoolyard in Los Angeles or something. There's so much open territory in this country that. When that happens, they just hit a field or something where there's nobody, <laughs> right, right. nobody, nobody <laughs> around. But we always picture it hitting something, right? Skyscraper. Um, yeah, we got lots of space. Turns out we got a lot of space left. Oh yeah. my god! I just flew in from uh, Oregon and Idaho and just look out the window the whole time. You don't see Weird. anything. So much there's land. Nothing. Why are we yeah. all so condensed? I don't know. Spread it out. Payne Lindsay. Hi, strange is the name of the podcast. And it's available wherever you find finer podcasts. Good to see you again, Payne. Thanks so much. I appreciate your time. All right. We'll take a uh, quick break. We'll come back, do a little news right after this. Let me tell you about O'Reilly Auto Parts. Well, you want to save some money? You want to save some gas? Here's a few things you can do to improve your fuel mileage. Check your tire pressure, people. If the tire pressure is low and one or more tires... You're going to use a lot more gas. Check out your owner's manual or inspect the tire yourself to find the recommended pressure. O'Reilly Auto Parts carries a wide range of tire gauges to make it easy to check your tires on a regular basis. It's also a lot safer when they're properly inflated. Always keep your fuel system clean. A fuel injector or carburetor cleaner is a simple, affordable way to remove carbon deposits and moisture from the fuel system and can improve the performance and efficiency of your engine. How about changing a clogged air filter? 
As an air filter clogs with dirt and debris, airflow becomes restricted and cause your vehicle's fuel management system to use more gas. Changing clogged filters increases the amount of air available to your engine, which boosts your fuel economy. For all the money-saving gas tips you need this summer, ask the professional parts people at O'Reilly Auto Parts or go to O'ReillyAuto.com. All right, what news do we have? All righty, so I have some, uh, we'll start off with a few animal stories. So first off, there is a zoo in eastern China Mm -hmm. that went viral because there's this video of this bear standing and interacting with the tourists, waving. Mm -hmm. So everybody on TikTok's like, they got a human dressed as a bear in their zoo. Well, they can get bears. I mean, bears in the circus, you can get those things to ride bicycles and stuff. Right. The standing and waving is a pretty... Right. Well, the zoo has denied suggestions, and these are, in fact, sun bears. And they're they're quite lovely. And, uh, yeah, so... They, they, they debunked that right away. It's so, kind of a bad sign for a nation, though, if we're accusing you of <laughs> not having real animals in, in your Well, it's a weird time. Like, you saw that guy zoo. who dressed himself up as a collie. Like yeah. Like a collie that started walking around. Yeah, I, I get it. I'm just, I'm just saying, it's like, you know, you hear those stories about, oh, if you're going to Rio de Janeiro, you got to bring a fake phone and a fake wallet, because if you get held up, you're going to want to hand them your fake wallet. I'm like, yeah. that's not a good sign as a nation. And if people are accusing, if people wouldn't do that about the San Diego Zoo or the Chicago right. Zoo, they'd go, maybe it's just a dwarf in an outfit. Like, we'd go, no, what are you talking about? It's a <laughs> zoo. We don't do that. Yeah. But the fact that we think you may do it is a bad sign for your culture. I, I agree. So, yeah, so maybe don't go to that zoo in eastern China, even if it is a real bear. Um, but there's a zoo in Toronto mm-hmm. that uh, lately has been advising its visitors to avoid showing videos and photos on their cell phones to the gorillas because oh. it distracts the apes. So they posted the sign saying, uh, yeah, please don't show that some content can be upsetting and affect their relationships and behavior within their family. Right, and there's a zoo in Chicago that even put up a rope line a few feet away from the glass to keep its visitors from showing their phones to these gorillas. So they're being really affected by, by I guess some showing the, some photos to these gorillas, mm-hmm. and uh, yeah, now they're they're starting to act weird. So they're trying to get ahead of it. Yeah, I mean, why not? I mean, I if a, if a gorilla. I don't know, has the mind of a three-year-old or something, and you could fuck up a three-year-old by just showing them weird footage of stuff, then I guess you could fuck up a gorilla, too. I haven't been to the zoo in a long time. I used to take the kids there. You went to the Oklahoma City Zoo, right? Oh, yeah. How was that? Yeah, that was pretty cool. Yeah. All I remember from the L.A. County Zoo is um, a couple things. One is uh, I saw a hippo take a dump underwater, which, my That's God. Sure. That's good oh, luck. my God. <laughs> In your culture, yeah. <laughs> it is boom, man. I mean, that, it's, it, it's a lot coming out. Yeah, the once. water goes up. Yeah. Um, number one. Number two. Um, good memory. They got the churro hut. I don't like the churro. I don't like that we've usurped the donut with the, with the churro. Mm. It's also the churro's. First, they had Sonny got one that was stuffed with cream and oh, it was they feel like them. super homoerotic, like watching your son gnawing away on this thing with the cream all over his face. <laughs> it's already it was, phallic shaped. It was, yeah, it was very gay. It, I didn't. Know? I didn't approve. Well, he should bite into it. He was. I heard he was sucking on it for <laughs> yeah. a while. Number rubbing around his face. Uh, the other one I didn't like at the zoo was I like the reptile hut. I've talked about this. It's been a long time though. They have the reptile hut, and they have these terrariums, these glass enclosures. Yeah. But the glass enclosures simulate where the tree snake is from or the toad is from. They're natural and habitats. They're natural habitat. But all creatures are meant to blend in with their natural <laughs> habitat yeah. because that's their camouflage for existing, right? Right. And so you have the natural habitat and you're staring at this thing like, where is that tree snake? Well, it's the exact same colors, the leaves on yeah. the thing. It takes a long time. Now, <laughs> if you're in the rainforest, you're going to get snatched up by a bird of prey. But if you're at the L.A. County Zoo, yeah, 
why can't we, we just have a nice tan background? Yeah. Just just a, just take a flat piece of plywood, paint a little gesso on it. I need some contrast here. And then that fucking tree snake would pop. Yeah. Completely. You could stare right <laughs> at it. And the tree snake would be freaked out momentarily. Because they're probably like, oh, shit. I'm going to get I'm, eaten. I'm going to eat my hawk. <laughs> but then you realize, no, nah, you got a lid and some lesbian okay. comes by and feeds you crickets twice a day. It's a sweet life. You're here to be seen. <laughs> I'm sorry, your highness. This is your life. And by the way, do they think they're in the rainforest? Their fucking cage <laughs> is three foot by four foot by 22 inches deep. You should have no threats. There's no threats, and you don't need to simulate where they were from because they don't think they're there. Yeah. Because if they were there, then they'd be traveling for miles walking around the rainforest instead of in this one little area. You're so right. It's so hard to find those things. And also, what would I want, would I want my bedroom growing up simulated in my house? It's a shithole. <laughs> no. I'd want something modern and sleek and white. Yeah. That's what we need to Minimal. do. That's that's what's in right now. Make anyway. make it minimalist, light, and let's look at the toad. Let's look at the snake. Let's look at the lizard. Don't give me the fucking lizard where I can't tell if it's the rock or the lizard. Or they give the big rock and the thing snapping underneath the rock, and I can see part of its tail hanging out. Yeah. Just flat, white. No rocks, no gravel. Because there's no motion either. Those things can stay perfectly still. They just sit there. You get a heat lamp and a white box. <laughs> and and then get I could go there and enjoy the shit out of it, right. right? I'd spot you immediately. And then, over the course of generations, the tree snake would start turning white with like a plywood design yeah. to start blending in to my new environment. And we could we could chronicle that. Yeah. that You could up the ticket price after that. People would want to see that. They yeah. fly from all over. Yep. Yeah, forget the I want to see it. You you go to those you go to the the terrarium there and try to try to look at the um, iguanas and stuff. You, you can't you spend you'll spend 20 minutes standing in front of one of those things going I uh, is he behind the rock? Is it even in here? Like, no. <laughs> White, boom. We see you. First off, we pay the bills. We pay for your food. We pay for the zookeeper. We pay for the, the land. You're here to be displayed. Right. Do not do not blend yourself in. You do not have a right. To you don't have a right to blend. You don't have a right <laughs> to blend. <laughs> and why would you? Why would you want to blend? You're here. Hello, everyone. You're the yeah. You're very rare. You're you the get attraction. To show yourself off. Right. Yeah. Like when Taylor Swift does a concert, do you think she does it with twenty-seven other skinny blondes wearing the same outfit, and we don't know which one she is? Right. No. Yeah. She's up front with the spotlight. Yeah, because we paid. And look how good she's doing. It's the that same thing. You. It's That's the same <laughs> thing. It's the same. It's the same difference. Yeah. Okay. So that's what I'd like. Yeah, me too. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm glad you really have figured out how to improve Zeus. So thank you. Well, I, first off, people are always like, "Oh, that would be cruel to the tree snake." Yeah, I could see Peter going. You're you're giving them get, some unnecessary get shitty stress. About it. Okay. Yeah. How about just being cooped up in a cage and fed by a lesbian your entire life? You know what I mean, like, haven't we already crossed that Rubicon? <laughs> they're all like, lesbians? They're all lesbians who feed them the crickets. We're already into this part where you're being cooped up for your entire life. Yeah. You know, you're a toad, you're a snake, you're a lizard, you're supposed to, you're supposed to roam God's earth, Make right? Make most of it. We've already taken away your rights. We're really going to, it's like... We put you in a prison cell, and PETA's pissed off on how it's decorated. Yeah. You're already in a cell. Right. That's it. Moot point. That's right. So fuck off, PETA. Let's just put them in this environment so me and my son can look at them. Eat some churros and look Eat at some Eat some churros snake. and point at the tree yeah. snake. You remember this video? Uh, it went viral a couple of years ago. This just shows just how crazy gorillas get, but there's this little girl who was patting her chest mm. at the glass in the gorilla just ran after her and launched himself. Oh, I didn't see this oh, one. You'll love this. It's crazy. It just it shows you the, the power of the silverback. Mm-hmm. So a little girl pounding her chest. Watch this this silverback. Oh man. 
Wow. Yeah, just jumped at her, wow. cracked the glass. Cracked the glass? Yeah. Yeah. So that pissed him off. Yeah. Can you imagine what showing uh, yeah, your, your selfies will do to him? Jesus Christ, yeah. yeah. Majestic creatures, though. So, um, all right, so let's go on to our next animal oh. in this segment. Mm. The beaver. Mm. Yeah, California is embracing beavers mm-hmm. and the role they play in the ecosystem. After years of viewing this animal as a nuisance, because they chew down trees and they block up streams, well, this, uh, our state has recently enacted a new policy encouraging landowners and agencies dealing with beaver damage to find alternative solutions before trying to kill these things. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so the aim is to preserve more beavers along with their nature-friendly behaviors because they include creating lush habitats and that lure species back into now urban areas. They enhance groundwater supplies and buffer against the threat of those wildfires, which are you know creating so much carbon emissions and oh, we uh, destroying okay. our couple things. Go ahead. Nature knows what it's doing. It, it really does. It just knows what it's doing, sort of has a way for all of its creatures. You can't just decide one is bad and remove it from the system and mm-hmm. expect the system to not change. Okay. So I'm a, I'm a big fan of Mother Nature kind of knows what they're doing. I mean, it's part and parcel of stop showering three times a day and scrubbing with pure health. Nature understands what it's doing. Let it be, yeah. Um, it's also sad that, as we talked about on the show, you know, one wildfire season undoes 10 years of saying. carbon capture and <laughs> solar panels and Teslas and when when all our hard work, it's all it's all <laughs> undone. Could could we do a better job of managing the forest? Could we go look um I, it's not sexy, and I know Gavin Newsom doesn't give a fuck, or Trudeau, or whoever's running whatever force is currently on fire. But and I know you guys want to blame uh, climate change. All right, okay, climate change, fine. So now we got two choices: manage the fucking forest or do something about climate change. Since it doesn't seem like you can do anything about climate change, you who never stops talking about climate change, then why don't we get back to managing the forest? See what we can control here. Let's see what we can control. But they don't do it. And then half of it in in L.A. or California, it's either caused by homeless people or decrepit power lines that fall over in windstorms. That's all... Every time I drive and I see a a plume of smoke, I'm like, oh, God. Right. And then they're billed as climate accelerated fires. Right. They were started by a transient. Right. Or a power line because you didn't manage the the grid and the shit was outdated and the pole fell over and started the fire. So can we can we do something here? And they always go, this is man made climate change. Good. How about undoing some of the man made shit like the hobos starting the fires or the power lines or manage your fucking forest? Would you please? And then you also kind of go. How into this problem are they like with carbon? Like, is it really like you can kind of go. Is John Kerry that worried about carbon? And if he's really worried about carbon, then why does he fly private everywhere? And if Gavin Newsom is that worried about carbon and emissions, then why have a forest fire every year that undoes a decade of your good work that you never stop talking about? I tend to believe they don't believe it. Right. Meaning like, I do not waste food, for instance, but there would never be a situation where you said, oh, I'm leaving. And I was like, all right, I'm just going to finish my meatloaf and then I'm going to leave. And then you came back. You're like, I forgot my sunglasses and I was scooping the meatloaf into the garbage. You would never (laughs) see that because I have one fucking mode because this is what I care about. Yeah. So if you really care about the whole carbon thing, why not get on the forest management a little bit? I think so. Yeah, yeah, they I don't agree. care. They okay. don't care. No. Um, do you remember that uh, killer, the preppy killer? Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Yeah. So Robert Chambers, known as a preppy killer for uh, murdering a teen back in Central Park back in 1986, was released again last week from prison after serving time for unrelated drug crimes. Just a reminder, so Chambers, when he was 19, he strangled Jennifer Levin, who was 18, to death 
in the case that became a tabloid sensation. He pleaded guilty to manslaughter after admitting in a taped confession to killing her during rough sex. Yeah, it was a uh, kind of she wanted it this way, and I crossed the crossed the line. You know what I mean? Right. So yeah, he served a 15 year sentence, and then uh, uh, for first degree manslaughter and second degree burglary, released in 2003, and then was imprisoned again in 2008 on unrelated charges of first degree criminal sale of a controlled substance and second degree assault. The thing about prison is it really tells you something about the human condition, which is most people go back to prison who leave prison. And if you think there'd be one lesson that was teachable <laughs> in our society, like we all get the Don't do that again. Yeah. Yeah. Like really this place that, you know, is the worst place ever. <laughs> you went out and did shit that would get you eligible to go back to that place. Yeah. And the answer is yes. And that's how most people roll. It's actually quite common. Super recidivism is, I don't know, 70% or something. It's 78%. I mean, it's it's insanely common. Weird, that's our wiring. But do you right? think it's because they haven't learned their lesson or that they there's maybe there's a part of them that just needs it? They don't know anything else and they just uh, I, want to go back. I think it's a combo of being a certain way, not having, you know, tangible skills to apply to the outside world. Also kind of a weird, you know, in order to commit crime, you have to have a certain amount of bravado. Yeah. You, you know what I mean? Like the notion of like, oh, I'm going to outrun this cop. You know what I mean? Like you have to have a strong, <laughs> healthy belief in yourself to to commit crimes. You yeah. know what I mean? Like you have to, you really kind of have to think about how much, bravado you have and then you're kind of like well they got me that one time but they're never gonna yeah. <laughs> i mean mi mixed with stupidity mixed sure. with you know ab abused as a child i mean it all it all factors in but and is this a guy that you want out does it bother the you the preppy killer yeah like you, you say like the menendez brothers or the versus. menendez brothers are, are fine yeah um and will be out soon i think um I don't, I mean, when you kill somebody, that's definitely a thing that crosses the line. The Menendez was, is different, as I've explained to you a few times. But I, I don't know. There's certain crimes where you can just do your time and, and get out. I'm yeah, sort of that way. For preppy it. killer. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, he's out, so you guys can hang. And I didn't even know why we called him the preppy killer, because he's wearing like an Izod shirt with a pop collar. And penny loafers or something when he was <laughs> raping this chick in the park. Yeah, I, sweater tied around his shoulders. Yeah, was he, I guess he was a student or something, yeah. but anyway. All right. Well, there you go. Uh, do you want to do another one or are you good? No, I think we got it. All righty. All right, let's see. I'm going to be in Las Vegas August 10th. Oh, that's coming up. Uh, and uh, August 14th. Appleton, Wisconsin coming up August 25th and 26th. Honolulu's coming up in September. September, Louisville, Louisville coming up. Louisville, yeah. that's coming up. San Francisco. Uh, so just go to amcrow.com for all the live shows. And uh, I want to thank Johnny Ferrar for coming in here and Payne Lindsay as well. And until next time, I'm Crow for Chris Max Pata saying mahalo. <laughs>